so I'd like to uh, call this uh, meeting uh, to order and move to the land acknowledgements. The land upon which we work, live, and sustain ourselves is the ancestral and treaty lands of the Michizagig and Nishinaabe, also known today as the Mississaugas of the Credit, the rightful caretakers and caretakers of this land. We also recognize the rich pre-contact history and relationships, which include the Anishinaabe and the Ongwe Hongwe. Since European contact, this land continues to be home to indigenous and non-indigenous people. As responsible community members, we value the diversity, dignity, and worth of all people. Colonialism displaced and dispossessed indigenous peoples of their ancestral land. And continues to deny their basic human rights, dignities, and freedoms. We are committed to learning true history, to reconcile, make reparations, and fulfill our treaty obligations to the original peoples and our collective responsibilities to the land, water, animals, and each other for future generations. Great, thank you. And before we go to the agenda, I just want to let uh, uh, trustees online that uh, I left my computer at home. So when you raise your hand, I'll have uh, our uh, board reporter be able to report when you want to talk. So uh, item three, approval of the agenda. Do I have someone to put that on the floor? Uh, Trustee Benjamin, uh, seconded by uh, Trustee Bailey. All those in favor? So be it, passed. Uh, does anyone have a declaration of uh, conflict of interest? Seeing none, I will move forward uh, on to the approval of the minutes uh, from uh, last uh, meeting of uh, April 12th. Do I have someone uh, put that on the floor, Trustee McDonald? Sure, and I also have a comment. About oh, you have a comment? Okay, so I'll put it on the floor. I'll have someone second it. Uh, Trustee, uh, I'll use Al's on mine. Um, now, uh, now that it's on the floor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to know if the, mini the minutes could be amended because I think it's important to capture, um, you know, uh, everything that happens in the uh, meeting. And I, especially, I think, under the naming and renaming of schools, it says a lengthy discussion and soon, but I think I'd like to let it be known that while as a trustee, I have to abide by the will of the board, I think it's important that the public reading the minutes would see that a, a strong objection was raised with regards to um, the impact that the way the policy is would affect um, a previous commitment the board had to a member of the black community and his family to name a space after the individual. Um, I think it's important that it, it is registered that um, it is important that the supervisor, Bruce Rodriguez, was connect, um, contacted to clarify whether or not he had approved the name of the, um, the building. Um, I, I think it's important to capture that. It's, um, I also had, um, at the meeting, I spoke about the fact that um, it's color, um, in the Mali, who the center was, um, as the community understood, named after him. He got a brain hemorrhage while typing a delegation to the board. And as a gesture, the board reached out to the family. The family didn't request it. And now, after you contacted grieving wife and family to renege on the promise, or it may even be that it was approved okay. by the Okay, okay. Uh, Trustee McDonald, uh, you know, we're amending the minutes of the conversation there. So I'm going to pass it over to our Governance Council. Okay. Uh, thank you for commenting through you, Mr. Chair. Minutes are a record of the action items. The recordings of the minutes are posted on the website, um, but the, the comments as you're expressing them um, we can verify if they were said or not through the recording, but the minutes would not capture the dialogue. The minutes only capture the action out of the minutes, so the minutes wouldn't be necessarily amended to include that. And um, you know, making these comments at this stage, but I'm I, I'm not sure. I'd have to check the recording that those comments were actually made at this meeting mm -hmm. at the um, governance and policy. I do recognize that there were some comments made at the board meeting about previous commitments, but the 
the extent of the comments um, being made now. Uh, I'd have to check the recording to see if they were made at the time. Mm -hmm. And further, um, they wouldn't be recorded in the minutes as they weren't action. It was just the conversation. So going forward, though, like here it says, comments are named about street named after individuals. That's not an action, but they name that. And I just think it's, you know, if your comments that are um, not necessarily supporting the decision should be made, so I think the public should know, have a sense of the type of discussion, even if it's not the details, but I know for sure that I mentioned about that the center um, was was my understanding that the center was uh, the family was contacted, but said to be named after it. So, and that would be captured. It, you know, as said, it would be captured. Sorry, to you, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. would be captured in the recording that is posted on the website. Okay. Okay. Any other comments or questions concerning this? Uh, all those in favor of the receipt of the uh, this? Okay, seen, seen approved. Okay, move on to our next item. Uh, there is no delegation, so we're going to move to our first uh, staff report uh, presented by Lashana Murray, uh, identity based uh, data collection policy, uh, introduced by our governance council. Thank you very much, and for you, Mr. Chair. Um, LaShawn Murray, our policy analyst, will be uh, taking us through the identity-based data collection policy. As you recall, it was at the April meeting as well, and she's bringing it for recommendation for um, approval at the board. LaShawn? Thank you, and through you, Chair. And so the identity-based data collection policy, its purpose is to permit the collection of PDSB student parent, guardian, staff, both current and job applicants, and trustee identity-based data through various intentional methods that are guided by the Anti-Racism Act and related legislation. Its second purpose is to establish the guiding principles governing the collection, analysis, and use of identity-based data to identify gaps and barriers in programming, differentiated supports, initiatives, interventions, and processes that may relate to systemic inequities to assess and address ongoing disproportionalities and inequities, to inform the ongoing monitoring of PDSB's initiatives and system changes, and to help inform practices, policies, interventions, and programs that aim to advance equity and accountability within the board. This policy will apply to all circumstances when the PDSB collects and uses the identity-based data of our students, parents, guardians, staff, both current and prospective, and trustees of the Peel District School Board. Since our last discussion at the April 2023 Governance and Policy Committee meeting, we've completed the consultations from the internal departments, the central superintendencies, the advisory committees, and the PDSB community. Based on this feedback, revisions to the draft policy presented include expanding the scope of the policy to include the collection of identity-based data of parents and guardians. And guardians, this would support our ongoing work regarding parent climate surveys and identity-specific parent advisories within our schools, to ensure the creation of an identity-based data collection and analysis framework that is grounded in board principles of anti-racism, anti-oppression, and human rights, and will inform the collection, use, and analysis of identity-based data, and to specify responsibilities for the central superintendencies executive leads and controllers will address that syntax on page 10 and the senior leadership team. At this time, we'd like to extend our sincere thanks to the PDSB community and to board staff for their contributions to the development of this policy and happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. I'd like to put this on the floor. Uh, Trustee Bailey uh, puts it on the floor and seconded by uh, Trustee Ells. Okay. Does anyone have any comments or questions about uh, the Awesome. Yes, Trustee Bill. Thank you, Chair. Um, when collecting data, um, it says in the report for it, the retention is for as long as it's needed for its intended purposes. So, are you only collecting data for each? Time you need it, and like say if you're collecting it for registration of kindergartners, when is that the purpose expires? Okay. 
Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the for the question. Each of the purposes, um, and you may recall, we had a records retention policy come to the to the um, meeting two meetings ago. So depending on the purpose, there's a corresponding retention period. So it's not a uniform thing. But if you're talking about OSRs, because that's where the information, the Ontario student record is where uh, registration information would go, it's the lifetime of the student record, which is it's 50 years past, past graduation. So if it was like something like the census. So the census will have it through you, Mr. Chair, the census will have a category in the retention bylaw. I don't know it off the top of my head, um, but I believe it actually corresponds with the OSR. So parents are going to know in advance how long this information is going to be kept on file. They will know based on the purpose of the collection and and they can cross reference with the retention bylaw. If it's at registration, it, it'll be the same length as the Ontario Street record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, see not. I have uh, one. Um, so the policy talks about the data collection, and et cetera, but I don't see comments around the frequency because I'm getting people asking me, I've, I'm filling out the student census and then now I'm filling out a school, uh, you know, um, I forget the acronym that's being used and it's the same information. Why are they asking me twice? And then, and it just seems to be, you know, why does, why can't we ask it once and keep it for other information? But I understand things change, but I'm just curious about that frequency and duplication, if not possible. Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Chair. The, the purpose is it's express consent. So the, the parents are giving consent for the collection of the information for the intended purpose. So each time if it's a different purpose, they be required to use the, the collect the information from the from the beginning again. The reason is we don't want to cross purpose. What we're trying to do is create a uh, a larger base for the collection through the the census. So you may see less of that going forward because the purposes in the census was a little broader this time. So you may see. And parents may see less filling in the information over and over again. But it really is, you have to give consent to collect the information for the intended purpose. So consent makes it that way. Correct. And, and that's, a, that's a good uh, comment. And do we put that in, do we put that in the surveys? Because I don't get them, so I can't talk to it. Thank you for the question and through you, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, okay. it is put in. And every time we collect information, there is a, we call it a BIPA statement, the Municipal Freedom of Information. And protection of privacy act and the statement talks about the express consent awesome uh chair a question uh, to uh, from trustee davis it just um from this can a parent uh pull their child out of this like is there something sent home before a questionnaire is sent to the student so that the parent can say no don't want this answered by my child and i don't want you to like yeah. Thank you for the question for you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, for example, the, the student census, while it was answered at the school setting, uh, it was sent home ahead of time for parents to review, talk to their children. Um, for the younger grades, it was actually answered at home and sent back. But for the older grades, uh, parents could uh, speak with their child ahead of time and, and assist them with it. Um, so yes, that's from the census perspective. Great. Thank you. Any more questions? I see a question, uh, Trustee Els. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair. J just wondering why we would uh, ask that in, in younger grades the census be sent home and in older grades uh, have it in the classroom. Um, uh, you know, I, I understand that you know in grade in closer to grade twelve, some students may may develop into adults and to adulthood. But for the vast majority of the grades, they're all minors. Why would we not send them all home to have uh, parent consent? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Chair. That's a, a question that I can take back to the, um, the, the research team that worked on the census, but in, in general, the, the feeling was that um, students wanted a voice, and so it's the, it's the census is filled out based on the student voice as opposed to the parent voice and whether that the children would actually understand some of the questions at, I believe it's grade three and younger, um, that it's, it's sent home to answer. The survey is available to all, all age groups though. So parents could have reviewed the survey with, with uh, the students regardless of age, but where it's filled out is at school for the older children and, and at home for the younger children. Thank you. Great. Uh, another question there from Trustee Davies. If it's filled out at school, um, no two-part question. If it's filled out at school, how do we know that we have parents' consent to collect the information? And for the younger ones that it's sent home, is there a spot where the parent says, hey, I saw this and I give you consent to collect this information and ask these questions and watch out? Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Chair. The school census, just so um, we're all talking about the same same thing here, is a legislative requirement. It is a requirement that the, the appeal board do, every school board do a student census. So there is awareness. We do send it out to the to the parents. They do know that it is happening, um, but the, it is a legislative requirement that we do a student census. I, I just get calls from parents, concerned parents, that they're children are being asked age inappropriate questions. So I just, I thought that it might help us if we have this, a, a little line saying, hey, parent or guardian, your child is filling this out and we're gonna collect it. Please sign here that you consent to this. Or if it's being filled out at the school, a letter home, a call home saying, listen, we're gonna do this on this and this day. Is it okay? Because uh, I, I get the calls, I get the emails saying, hey, do you realize that my kid's in grade three and he was asked this, 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 and this question, and that's totally offside, and I didn't even know, and uh, I'm just trying to build with the community, that's all. And uh, I think that would go a long way in, in, in helping to build the community, rather than let's just see what we can get away with, because it's legislated. Yes, please. Thank you for the follow-up and through you, Mr. Chair. The communications were sent home. To, to the parents before the survey. And, and the survey was available online before the survey was taken to the school. So there, there wasn't a sneak attack right. to gather this information. It was it was shared ahead of time in, in multiple communications and available on the website. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, any other questions? So since it's on the floor, uh, I have a uh, vote to, to receive this report. Yes, uh, so be approved. Recommend. Rec sorry, recommended to be approved and taken to the board meeting next week. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to 7.2. Um, the community engagement policy has been distributed to us in an email earlier uh, this week, and I'll pass it over to our governance council, who will then hand it over to Lisa Hart for presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next item on the agenda is the community engagement policy. And it's going to be presented today by Lisa Hart, the Superintendent of Equity, Indigenous Education, School Engagement, and Community Relations. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Chair, tonight we are seeking recommendation for approval of the draft community engagement policy. As outlined in the board report, the community engagement policy provides a framework, values, and principles for accessible, inclusive, equitable, and meaningful engagement with communities. This policy will support the work of the PESB to advance equity, human rights, and anti-racism across all learning and working environments. Ministry Directive 10 requires PESB to develop a comprehensive outreach plan to rebuild and maintain trust and credibility with the board community, particularly with Black communities. In order to guide the development of the outreach plan, as well as subsequent plans, the PDSB must first have a policy and procedures that provide guidance and expectations with respect to how the board engages with the community. The community engagement policy will serve as an intentional tool, tool to build and maintain the relationship between PDSB and its communities. 
The purpose of community engagement is to work in partnership with community members to share information, experiences, and perspectives in order to inform decision making. We welcome any feedback on the draft community engagement policy. Thank you. Um, can we put it on the floor? No? no. Okay, so can I have it put on the floor? Trustee Ells uh, puts it on the floor. Someone second it? Uh, Trustee Benjamin? Okay, now that it's on the floor, um, I have a question of Trustee Ells. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair. I, I just a question. I, I'm not sure if I missed it, but I looked for it in my agenda package and I didn't see the policy included. Um, is this a verbal presentation? Uh, so, so it was sent uh, just let me earlier this week. Uh, let me just see if I have the email somewhere. Um, it was sent to the distribution list on Monday. So it was sent on Monday. If you look at your emails, you'll see the uh, from legal governance, you'll see a 7.2 communication. communication. Got it. Uh, I'll pull it up through there again, but uh, okay. thank you for the clarification. And remember, this is draft. It's not final. It's not going to, um, um, you know, our board. It's just to be any. Oh, it is. It's draft, meaning that it's. Oh, if we don't send it back, or you know, it's okay. So when we sort of through through you governance, when we um, council, when we say the word draft, it's really not draft. It's draft until it gets here. It gets, it's draft until it gets here. Understand the the, the workflow now. Okay, so. Uh, do we have any comments or questions? Uh, yes, uh, Trustee McConnell. Thank you. A few, Chair. So when um, I read this uh, document, I was actually saddened because I look at the background and under it it says in February 2020 the, the review of the PDSB was issued. Um, it was reported that the PD, PDSB had problems effectively communicating with its local communities. The review reflected the concerns of parents and community members, in particular, black parents and communities who felt frustrated with the lack of communication and generally felt disrespected by senior administration and the boards of trustees. So I go back to how can we present this policy to the community? And because the policy says we are to maintain trust and credibility with the black communities, and then we have we do what we did with the naming um policy because it, to me this document is not matching our actions because we have gone to a family requested and the board was aware because i know I, have, I raised it right and to me you have a situation where um and three chair can i ask for example if the family was told about because that would affect in terms of you know credibility. Like, I don't understand how we can have this policy and then we're doing what we're doing with regards to the naming of a community center. I'm going to pass this over to our government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question and through you, Mr. Chair. The naming of schools, uh, special spaces and facilities um, was before this committee on multiple occasions, three or four um, occasions in the past, and the policy was recommended for approval by this committee, and then was approved at the approved at the board. So the naming of the center call is following the naming of schools policy. The consultations that were done for the naming of schools uh, was built into into that policy at the time. This is the overarching policy for community engagements going forward and how we will be engaging with the community. So guidance, this policy is providing guidance to other policies, but also other uh, opportunities for community engagement uh, that the board would you know, require feedback or desire feedback, not just require, but also want feedback, engage the community. Uh, for example, the strategic day, the uh, development of the multi-year plan, um, and there are there are lots of other opportunities to engage the the community. So this is the an overarching guidance um, policy to ensure that the way the engagements are happening are um, equitable, are inclusive, and will 
um, afford the opportunity for the community to be able to express their feedback. But the naming of schools in the future will be guided by this, but the naming of schools policy was um, was already approved. Yeah, no, I get that, but I'm just saying, so we have approved this policy, so I, I follow that timeline, but then we have now this community engagement policy. And I'm saying in the policy, we just went through a process that is, does not do anything to, to maintain trust and credibility with black communities, in my opinion. And what we're saying now to the community is that, yes, we are, we are going to be maintaining, working towards maintaining trust and credibility with black communities. Because if you remember, we were under supervision primarily because of concerns of anti-black racism. And we're supposed to be building bridges and repairing and rebuilding trust in the community. And so we bring this forward to them, but we have done something that is has undermined trust. So I'm just saying this to me seems almost going to be like a slap in the face of the community when it's brought forward because of our previous actions. Thank you for your comments yeah. and uh, so noted and um, uh, we appreciate your, your feedback. Thank you. And is that going to be, um, because I know it's not an action item, but is that going to be appear in the minutes that this discussion happened or is it just going to be um, in thin air? We, it will, this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available on the website. Um, we can note in the minutes that there was a discussion and there was uh, opposition to the policy. Um, yeah. Okay. For the yeah. Or, or not obviously more concerned about, yeah, how, you know, we have this policy and the action based on the school name and what the board did does not, that goes against what this policy is saying. That's my opposition or my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Benjamin. Thank you. And through you, Chair. Uh, my question is, uh, when we say we want to maintain the relationship between PDSB and its communities, uh, how would you define communities? Here you mentioned undeserved and marginalized. So does it only refer to racialized groups in the uh, PDSP. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you for your question, uh, Trustee Benjamin. And I think when we speak to community engagement broadly, um, we are talking about the many um, aspects of you know who comprise our school communities. However, as identified in the ministry review, we recognize that there are particular communities um, who felt that their voices were not heard and that the community engagement that was occurring um, did not include. So this particular policy is designed to ensure that we are accessing and engaging and providing opportunities for those voices who have been historically traditionally marginalized from these processes. So just to add to that, um, uh, you know, we take the student census, and as for the census, uh, and, and some of the communities within the Pierre School Board's geographical limits are considered to be high SVI, that is socioeconomic vulnerability. So some of these are in pockets which are part of the trustees' wards. So here it's not racialized groups, but it's a community which could have, you know, low income groups and uh, such uh, communities. So will they also be considered uh, in this, what you call it, uh, when, we, when we frame this policy or when we implement this policy? And the second thing, yesterday it was also brought up in the CAC committee. And so there are a lot of stakeholders involved, you know, as part of the CAC uh, community. So are these also going to be considered because they are a very vocal group and, you know, they advocate for their, uh, this, their communities. So, when, so that's what I say, undeserved, marginalized. I think, are we encompassing all these communities? So, 
Thank you for the follow-up question through you, Mr. Chair. As we develop the relevant procedures and the community engagement framework, we'll be consulting uh, multiple stakeholder groups across the PDSB to really amplify the voices of all of the students, staff, and internal and external stakeholders that we serve. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Through you, Jared. I'm. I like the fact that this policy is looking to um, uh, have a policy of community engagement and involvement of all communities uh, and all families within the Peel District School Board. My question is, when there is a um, community engagement planned and it's canceled for whatever reason. Now, usually you give all the dates, and then when it's canceled, that date is just canceled. But then people have that date, they rearrange, they wouldn't be able to accommodate another date. Is there a way to still make events happen? It's not a part of policy, I'm assuming it would go in the procedures, mm -hmm. right? Which understandable is not governance. Um, but at the same time, it's looking at including people, everyone. So how do you accommodate for that? Is there a possibility to say if it's a person, because like this this year, the weather prevented us from having one of them. And I know quite a few people that couldn't go to any of the other dates, except for the one that was canceled. Right? So then they didn't participate at all. How could you make that doable? And I see that you are trying, so I commend that. Thank you for the question, Trustee Bailey, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, in regards to that event, that an engagement was canceled because of a, a massive snowstorm, and many were digging themselves out that day. Uh, so what we, what we did do was that when the Paul after we received feedback from that initial drafting of the policy. We did then take the policy to an online survey that was open for two weeks um, and it was communicated through multiple different platforms to allow for opportunities for voice like you spoke about. We know that there are different ways in which engagement can occur both in person, online, small groups. So I think as you spoke to in the operating procedures, we'll be thinking about the ways in which we communicate dates in advance and plan for weather dates, um, given that you know we live and in, in weather where sometimes it's not hot, warm, and sunny. Yes, as we covered Thank you, and through you, and just to, to add what um, Superintendent Hurd is saying, after that event, we, we actually took that into consideration, and we've made a, a permanent page on the website for consultations. So um, at any time, you can click on there and see what's happening, when, and the documents for the consultation are there. So there's widespread um, you know, knowledge and, and availability to provide comments. And there's certain windows for surveys and things, but there is an actual consultation page. Only one way, but it is it is one. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. And Trustee Ellis, I see your hand there. And Mr. Chair, I can't raise my hand, but when, when Trustee Ellis finish, I got a comment. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair McDonald. Through you, I, I, I what, first I want to thank staff for bringing this policy. I think that the that at face value, this policy is, is great, and I think it it uh, um, is a wonderful thing to have. I, I do think that I might have found a, a, a couple gaps and, and that I wanted to raise. Um, so I've got four points that I think might offer some gaps. So I'll start with a little bit of uh, clarity and specificity, and I, I think the policy might is lacking a little bit regarding clear guidelines on how community engagement will be conducted. Uh, this might lead to ambiguity, ambiguity in its implementation. I think without specific procedures and protocols, it may be challenging for stakeholders to understand their roles and responsibilities. This might result in inconsistent or ineffective engagement efforts. I also think that there's a gap when it comes to insufficient consideration of time and resource constraints. Uh, I think the policy doesn't address the practical challenges that may arise from limited time and resources 
when it comes to community engagement activities. And I think if we don't have proper consideration for these constraints within the policy, it might be difficult to conduct thorough and comprehensive engagement processes. And, and this might lead to um, unintended uh, in, uh, incomplete decision making. Um, the, the last uh, couple points I have on this is I think that the policy might not um, have safeguards in place or a way to measure uh, or mitigate potential biases or undue influence in the community engagement process. Without proper checks and balances, I think we might have a risk of, uh, you know, some groups or stakeholder groups that might exert disproportionate influence over others regarding the decision making process or comprising of the fairness and objectivity of that process. And my last bit is that while the policy mentions accountability, it doesn't necessarily outline specific mechanisms for holding the PDSB accountable when implementing community <laughs> feedback. So I think it might be helpful to see, the, see those edits uh, made to the policy. Um, but again, just really want to thank staff for the policy. I think it's it's wonderful. And um, I do think that this is a policy that that is 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 needed. But I think those are, are a couple of gaps that we might be able to fill. Thank you, Trustee Hills. You really went fast through that. So uh, I'll turn it over to, to yeah. The yeah, Tuesday yeah. Governance Council uh, and, and go from there. So, uh, thank you for the question. And through you, Mr. Chair, you raised four points, and I'll, I'll take them in order. The first one was um, guidelines on how this is to be implemented. Those are procedures and guidelines that will be, as, as Superintendent Hart did mention, uh, that's the next stage. Is they are the policies and procedures will be coming. So it's not necessarily um, for the actual policy, but procedures, guidelines. Um, templates, etc., will be developed uh, following the, the approval of the policy. The second one was time and resource constraint. You're absolutely right. There's lots of opportunities for um, consultation, and that will be um, will have to be tempered by the amount of time and resources that are available. That will be measured through the reports that come back to the trustees. Um, to show this is the, for example, if we're doing um, policies, we can do seven policies because that's the amount of time that we have and resources that we have uh, to do the proper consultations for each of the policies. So you'll be aware of that while the um, work is unfolding, whether it's policy work or, or other work for the consultation. So it's not necessarily a policy requirement. It is just a fact of reality with time and resources. For the third one, the safeguards, the biases in the process and disproportionate um, influence, that's one of the reasons to have the policy in the first place. It's to provide that framework to, to monitor, hopefully prevent, but certainly be aware of that. When there's consultations and, and reports are coming back to the board for um, approval or for recommendation for approval, Part of the reporting process will be the community engagement that was done. So you'll be able to, as a trustee um, and as the board, see what community engagement has happened and we'll be able to, to gauge that. You likely will not get the, this person said that, but you'll get the aggregate of the information that's, that's provided and that, that will be an influence on the, on the reporting, on the program or policy, and um, as trustees, that's where your influence will come in in the voting for those programs and, and policies. As to the fourth one, the accountability piece, how do we ensure that the PDSB will be accountable to this? Again, with the reports that come back to the, the trustees, you'll be able to see what the community engagement was. That's the accountability piece. So if you see a report, that comes back and, and you think there should have been community consultation and there was a community consultation, that may be an opportunity to return or, or make a recommendation that's supported by the, the balance of the board, would be able to say, take this back, let's have some community consultation on it and, and go forward. So there is accountability at a variety of, of levels, um, the actual implementation for the particular programs and those that are leading that, uh, together with the uh, director uh, as we're bringing reports forward and then ultimately the board as well. For you, Chair. Th thank you very much. That that clarification was uh, much appreciated and very helpful. Thank you. I, I don't have any further questions, Chair. Okay, we'll now go to Chair Green online. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, truly, Chair, um, just uh, would 
ask that maybe we may take a, a look at the word marginalize, uh, because we constantly use that word. And that word, as far as I'm concerned, and the community is concerned, because this is something that I'm dealing with in the community, is uh, the word marginalize is a stereotyping word. And uh, if we could use maybe word like vulnerable community, I think it would, it would go over well. Uh, especially a policy that we we are created to communicate with the community, uh, because when communi um, community is already under enough stress and pressure, oppression and so forth, we d we, we don't want to uh, be in the, uh, stereotyping them anymore. So I think um, as we move forward as a board, I think we need to uh, remove that word and, and maybe use vulnerable or another word uh, because that's a stereotyping word. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you for the comment, Chair Green, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the feedback and the comment, um, and we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Okay, uh, but we're voting on that, um, and so we, have, you know, we have to either make the change here or sorry, sorry, through the government's comments. And thank you for the further comment yeah. through you, Mr. Chair. The these, these statements that are expressed in the policy and in the report are um, the express language that we have used throughout the directives and, and otherwise. And to make a change at this stage may not necessarily represent what's happening in the community and what work has been done. But what we can do is take that back for um, you know future consideration and to include going forward. It's good feedback. Um, as far as this policy, if that is the uh, intended language change future, these policies are never etched in stone and the ability to come back and to update the policies based on any updated language is always a possibility and can be brought back at either the, the behest of a, of a trustee uh, back to this committee or otherwise mm -hmm. in order to um, into, in order to affect that. I would be hesitant to change the language on the fly when that's language that the community has um, is familiar with and has been um, accustomed to in appeal documents at this stage. But again, I think that it's good feedback for us to consider and going forward with our work. Uh, Chair Green, any comment? Are you muted? That red button means muted, right? Mm -hmm. Just agree, you're muted? Yeah, um, yes, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I would appreciate that. And as we move forward and review uh, policies, and I, I think it would be important that we, we take a look at that and uh, look at the, the sentiment of these words that we use in terms of the policy and how we, we, we classify community, our, our individual communities. So uh, I appreciate we can't go back now, but as we move forward and look at revision of policies, I would like to see uh you know that word is uh start we start looking at using other words than that word so but i thank you for the feedback appreciate it thank you thank you mr chair thank you uh trustee mcdonald yeah thank you through you chair um if i could suggest if if they're looking at um rewording probably say that the system marginalizes rather than marginalize and because to me vulnerable just using the word vulnerable is the same thing as marginalized it's still you're right, stereotyping. So I would say that the system marginalized would be a better way to phrase it. And I think a lot of people are changing. That's all the language is changing to. If you look at, yeah, so a lot of people are moving away. Yeah, thank you. Associate Director Logan, you would like to come up? Through you, Chair, as I was raising my hand, that was exactly okay. what I was going to articulate as well, but, um, similar to what um, Trustee McDonald had said, that um, when we speak about marginalization, it's talking about how systems and structures impact particular communities. It's not a label that should be attributed to communities, and sometimes people do that. They say marginalized communities as opposed to historically or traditionally marginalized. Um, when we use the term vulnerable, vulnerable 
it may not necessarily convey the way that the system is operating to impact. And so that's why we often use the term marginalized, but we should say historically marginalized or the way that systems and structures marginalized, not, not labeled a community as such. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Director Logan. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I think Lucas, uh, Trustee. Uh, uh, yes. Alves? Yes, through you, Chair. I just, I, I think Chairman Green's made a good point, but I just want to be, uh, you know, ex explicitly clear as we write these and these become policies that we govern by. Well, while marginal marginalized populations are often vulnerable due to the disadvantages that they've they could face, not all vulnerable populations are necessarily marginalized. I think it's important that we that we understand that marginalized, uh, per its definition, refers to individuals or groups who are pushed to the margins of society and may have experienced social, economic, or political disadvantages, and vulnerable refers to individuals or groups who are more susceptible to harm, exploitation, or adverse conditions due to various factors. I think as we select the definitions, it's, it's inherently important that we're explicitly clear, um, and I think uh, um, the point that was made ju just a moment ago, it's hard to, to, to define who, who spoke last. I wasn't able to, to see from where I'm looking on the screen, but the, the, it, the point that was made about systemic marginalization is a valid one. I think that the ministry uses this definition, marginalized, uh, specifically because of its definition. So I think before we reword the policy, you know, um, perhaps legal governance can review, but it's. It, I think I don't think they mean the same thing. I think they mean two very different things, and I think we we just have to be really specific which 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 one we use and when. Yeah, thank you, uh, Trustee Allison. I believe our, our governance council and uh, superintendents have said that we take that feedback for moving forward. Uh, but this policy is is unless we have a motion to change the wording, uh, is is on the floor. Uh, any other comments or questions? Okay, those all in favor to, uh, taking uh, recommending this to the uh, board meeting passed. So we're got that one complete. So now we're going on to 7.3. So can I have someone put this on the floor? Uh, Trustee uh, Baylor puts it on the floor. Someone second, Trustee Ellis. Okay, this is the months of recognition days of significance presented uh, by uh, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. The months of recognition days of significance report will be shared today for information. This report provides information regarding observance of months of recognition and days of significance, which are included in POs diverse communities. Days of significance can be secular, creed, and our cultural observances and celebrations. Days of, days, days of significance are associated with the acknowledgement of social changes and raising awareness of diversity, underrepresented, and currently and or historically marginalized groups. The board maintains a days of significance calendar and board recognized days. There are some predetermined identified religious and cultural observances and days of significance that in consultation with faith leaders and community members have been identified as red dot days and open circle red dot days. A solid red dot indicates that we should not schedule events including but not limited to learning assessments and evaluations at any time on these days. Open red dot days indicate that no events should be scheduled the evening before the identified red dot day. This report outlines an operating procedure which applies to how months of recognition, days of significance are acknowledged and communicated within the Peel community. Community groups, organizations, and internal and external stakeholders can submit a request for the addition of a month of recognition, day of significance, to be included in the upcoming year's calendar. The procedure will be administered by the Public Engagement and Communication Support Services Department in partnership with the Equity Indigenous Education School Engagement and Community Relations Department. Each year, a month of recognition, Days of Significant Committee is formed to review the various requests, and the committee includes representatives from senior admin, union representatives, human rights office, the communications department, workplace equity, and students. The Days of Significance and Heritage Month calendar 
informs the planning of meetings, events, and celebrations across PDSB sites. The calendar, such as the trustee board and committee meeting schedule, takes into consideration both red dot and open red dot days. The calendar can be found on the board's website page on the calendar chiclet, both internal and external, for those who are wanting to know the dates. So happy to take any questions at this point. Okay, and just so I'm clear, it, this is, we're recommending this to go to the board meeting. That's what I thought I heard the word, information. So we're not, uh, we're just hearing about it. Okay, just a report. Good. So uh, I, um, uh, I put it on the floor, right? Yeah, so I have Trustee Davies. Um, I, I think if we were to pull up the calendar, um, I think you'd find a lot of red dot days and a lot of red circle days. And I, I've just become concerned about the workload of meetings and the scheduling of meetings. Um, I, call me old school, but it, I mean, if the school's open, and our staff has to work. I, I think that we should be able to schedule meetings and, and, and we should be working on those days too. Um, again, just throwing that out there. We're gonna run out of days, guys. We're running out of, we've already run out of months twice with the uh, significance and month of recognition. And uh, I just think if you were to actually pull up the actual calendar, you'd find so many red days that, I don't, I don't know, guys, we're gonna run out of days. Thank you. Uh, do we have a response to that? So thank you for the question, uh, Trustee Davies, and through you, Chair. Uh, Red Dot Days um, are an opportunity to really center students, staff, and intersectional identities. And it's really an opportunity to build more inclusive schools. And so that opportunity to really consider the students who may not be attending uh, that day because they're they're celebrating or staff who may be celebrating. That's something that when we think about our PDSB culture and the ways in which we promote inclusion and opportunities for students to engage, that's how kind of the, the red dot days were determined and why we continue to, to center and affirm the identities of the students we serve. And I'll just add to that um, question because uh, I don't know when it was 10 years ago, we went through the uh, process of um, we had a hundred uh, bolded days, uh, so it was 2012. So okay, it was 2012. So it was 11 years ago when uh, um, you know truly uh, you know said 100 days. This makes it very difficult to do interviews because we had, you know interviews was a part of it, uh, board meetings, and school council meetings, and etc. So at that time, the, uh, you know it, it went back to the various groups and the faith groups and the various people to review. What is actually a bold day and what is a, a circle day and it was, uh, it was reduced to about 50 at the time um i haven't seen the calendar now mm -hmm. but anyway i just want to highlight that uh, you know it's a, something that can be say that you know be sent back it, like we did in 2012 as it's outlined in the report december 11th mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah but just i hey i come from the private sector and i know that Every day is a work day, unless it isn't. And uh, so I just wanted to, I, again, if from the school level or something like that, we're going to do something like that. But I just thought as trustees, perhaps we should look at um, respecting staff and, and uh, you know, not, we're going to only have like 40 days where we can have all of our meetings and it's preparing for meetings and presenting and stuff like that becomes difficult on staff and, and to sort of really scrutinize on what our red dot days are. So. Thank you for your comment. Trustee Bill. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, as somebody who strongly believes in inclusion, I really do like the idea of um, days of significance. And so things like Ramadan this year would not have happened if this policy was in place. That being said, I understand what uh, Trustee Davies is saying because when you look at the amount of observances and special hol religious holidays and special days, it does take away a lot. It does put a lot of red dots and open red dots. So it really is um, to what chair, the chair is saying is 
to um, really look and figure out a way in how we can balance inclusion and still operate and be feasible, right? We don't want anyone to feel left out and or to feel like they're not special enough or um, their cause, their their beliefs is not important. So recognizing that and how can we balance it? It is you are making a valid point, right? This is my words in your mouth, but are you wanting to put a motion or something to have staff go back and reevaluate all of the, the, the red or, or, or I, 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 I would like that. Yeah. Okay, well, so, to come up with motion. some way for um, we can be inclusive, celebrate and acknowledge, but at the same time, do not put so many red dots on the camera. So, can I help you maybe frame a motion? Sure. And please, you know, I'm not telling what you, but it, 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 a motion has to direct staff to do something. So if you uh, maybe to bring a report on the number of of bolded and, and not you know, the non bolded days, and then with that report, because this report didn't include that, if I'm correct, then you can then when the next governance meeting and the report comes in, we can decide. Say, yeah, that's that's a good amount because we don't know, right? So I'm just suggesting as a suggestion. Do we know? Um, through you, Chair, Chair, not off the top of my head right now. I could pull up the calendar and count. I would have to come back with that information about the number of red dot days. We have not added any additional red dot days to the calendar for next year. We have added the for recommendation days that amplify and support days of significance as well as heritage months, but not denoted as red dot days. And the red dot days were confirmed by our faith leaders across the PDSB in terms of you know, creating those opportunities for staff and students as well as staff who may be presenting at some of the committees that you're speaking about who may not be able to attend because they're also celebrating on that particular red dot day or open red dot day. So that's also a consideration um, was around staffing availability as well when we're thinking about how we serve the larger system. So you could put a motion on to just request the number of days and, and then when that report comes have a, a more informed conversation that says is it too much, too little, and then figure out where to go forward. Can, I, can you just put a motion on? Sorry? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> no, I can't put a motion. Okay. I'm the chair. I'm just okay. helping you. you know? Okay, so I'd like to put a motion forward on staff to come back with a report of how many red dots and open red dots, please, for the next meeting. And, and, and because it's directing next meeting, I just will ask the question, is that enough time to make it to the next meeting? Okay, so that's the motion on the floor. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Uh, Trustee yes. Alex. Yes. Trustee Alex. Okay, do we have any discussion around this uh, motion? Uh, you can actually introduce the motion. You have five minutes if you want to talk about the motion. No? Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about the motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I, uh, I'm i totally supportive of this uh, motion because I uh, feel also that uh, many of the uh, old days, I, I want to be inclusive, uh, but a lot of bold days are crippling us from doing board business. And we have to find a way, way how we still be in the same time for board business. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, even just uh, this doing that, I promise. I know he is. Okay, uh, Chair Green, you're, you're breaking up. Uh, so I, I think we've got your, the gist of what you're saying. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, does any other trustee have any comments uh, to this? Sir? Yes, uh, yes, Trustee Hart, you would like to respond to the Trustee Hart? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair McDonald, and the, the only thing that I would offer, happy to bring back the dates, however, we would only be able to implement a change in red dot days 
for the 2024-2025 as the, the calendar will be confirmed at the board meeting for June 14th and the consultation with faith leaders has already occurred around red dot dates for 2023-2024. Absolutely, and and that's it, we understand how the process and timing works. And our calendar has been so far advanced, but uh, anyway, um, so Trustee Benjamin, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is not to add any uh, any more days uh, to the calendar. It's just uh, that certain communities, uh, like I I belong to the South Indian community, and they have certain festivals and cultural. Uh, what you call it, uh, celebrations, which do not are not reflected at all as a board. So I have got people from the community asking me how to do it, and uh, so is it possible to bring? I mean, we know we know you have the days of recognition committee and days of process. So I could ask these people to make the application uh, to be included because, and to just give you an example, we recently celebrated Baisakhi, which is north. It's a, a, what do you call it, a spring festival, which is also celebrated in the South, and they call it Vishu. So it's the same day, but you could include it in that calendar. So they say, okay, we are also represented. And, you know, in different parts of India, they are celebrated in different ways. So, and you have communities who feel that they should be. So we could inform these people approach the board through the committee and make your application. The second thing that I would like to, and maybe it could be included somewhere in the policy, is that these are all cultural celebrations. These are all celebrations where uh, we are happy that, you know, it's spring, come on, let's celebrate. And this is how we do it in our community and so on and so forth. But I've also observed that certain um, maybe even heritage months celebrations statements are made which reflect the political it could be political statements of certain things happening maybe in their countries so my request and suggestion is that when the teachers are whoever is in charge of these we should uh, you know include somewhere that no statement that reflects any current political situation should be included in the speeches made by the kids. The students are just reading out something that has been given to them. I'm sure they don't understand grade five, or grade six student. So it's just an observation because it happened uh, at one of these events and I felt okay. And that was totally inappropriate because it was making a comment on a political situation. Thank you, uh, Trustee Benjamin. Do you want to reply? Thank you, Trustee Benjamin, and through you, Mr. Chair, in terms of the application process, part of why we've developed this operating procedure is to be, you know, build more transparency around the application process and the way in which internal and external stakeholders can put in a request around the addition of a day of significance. And unfortunately, not all of the days are about celebration. So for example, May 5th would have been the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And so there are also days that are an opportunity to bring education and awareness uh, to both students, staff, and families around you know, issues that they need to have a greater understanding about. And to your second point, uh, you know, thank you for that feedback and the way in which our de the department curates and provides resources. There's an opportunity to provide some feedback around, you know, providing information around geopolitical issues. Thank you. And uh, let me tell you that, you know, what all our staff do wonderful work in educating our students. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And before we continue, I just want to make sure we have a motion on the floor. So we're speaking to the motion. Okay. Anyway, uh, Tracy McDonald. No, sorry, I'll wait for the motion okay. and then. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so do we have any other conversations left on the on the motion? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, Trustee Bailey, you can close. You have three minutes to close if you'd like to close. Okay. So we're going to put it to a vote on the motion, which is to uh, ask staff to, at the next government meeting to bring a report on the number of bolded and unbolded days. Though, uh, those in favor of the motion, uh, I see. Uh, yes, we have uh, approval. So, so approved. 
Okay, uh, now we can go to the trustee yes. McDonald and comment on this, uh, the report for information. Thank you. Um, so your discussion <laughs> just um, triggered something I was going to ask you. Well, you see when you mentioned the um, month of recognition slash days of significance, I was just wondering if, um, one, is there a procedure, an operating procedure in days, let's say, a celebration or not celebration, like Red Dress Day, right? Um, how does that get disseminated through the system? Because I was doing a, um, I was presenting at a school for um, a Black History, not Black History Month, a, a, a Black Studies course, right? And it happened to be on Red Dress Day, and one of the students in the class was an Indigenous student, and she um, said, hey, um, I was upset because I didn't hear that the, the school didn't announce it was ready. So like, I'm wondering how these, like the days such as those, are they, is there a procedure? How like schools are, to, yeah. Oh, thank you for the question, Trustee McDonald, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair, in terms of how information is provided, it is, dependent on the particular day and the ways in which we provide resources. For, so for Heritage Months, uh, my department does provide uh, a website as well, as well as resources that are available to educators so that they have opportunities to engage uh, their students in meaningful ways, as well as we offer uh, various live events where you know teachers can sign up their class to attend. For example, for the day that we're talking about, National Day of Awareness of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirited Peoples, we did put out a memo as well as there was a system communication that went out with resources that was uh, created by the Indigenous Education Team to support educators in doing that in a way that is age appropriate, as well as ensuring that you know, they, they understand what occurred and there was an email sent to the all staff. So it depends for different days. We do provide uh, resources as well as central communication. Every you know day of significance is recognized through some sort of commu on the communication side in terms of it's recognized, but in terms of resources, it's not for every day, but we think about kind of the ways in which we can provide resources to the system. Okay, thank you. So through you, Chair. Yes. Um, so a day, um, of such significance, right? Because it's really, I would assume, it's, it's not more a celebration, it's more about learning and an awareness piece, right? So, but there's currently no um, requirement that all schools, just like Orange Shirt Day, is, is there no requirement that it should be um, like mentioned at the school or it should be um, tweeted on Twitter or like on, on the Facebook, like social media, is there a yeah, requirement for that? So thanks for the follow-up, Trustee McDonald, and again through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there is, there was a request put in by the Indigenous Education Team to have that date added to our Days of Significance calendar for next year. Okay. And so the, over the summer, Communications Department and our, our department will be looking at the ways in which we recognize, amplify, and communicate uh, the various days of recognition and how we do that in a way that is supportive and inclusive of all of the stakeholders that we serve. Okay, thank you. And so, I have one more question. Okay, uh, can I just ask a yeah. couple of questions? So, so if I understand, not all days of significance are coming into the school as teachable opportunities. Is that what I understand you said? Teachable in terms, sorry, again, thank you for the question yeah. and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, some days are recognized where schools have the opportunity to create learning entry points right. and then there are days that are curated by, you know, various departments who provide resources through from the system. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Trust me, you had another question. Yes, I had another question. It currently on the, um, Days of recognition. Is it officially on our calendar, the Tamil Genocide Education Week? So thank you for the question, Trustee McDonald, and through you, Mr. Chair. It was it will be added to the calendar for next year, uh, okay. Tamil Genocide Education Week. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Trustee McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a clarification. You said that all schools get this information. In what timeline do they get it? Is it the day after the day before or enough time to plan something? 
So thank you for the question, Trustee Bailey, and through you, Mr. Chair, for Heritage Month, uh, we do send that information. Our goal always is to have it sent out um, a week in advance of the particular Heritage Month. Uh, if it's for a day of significance um, or a day of recognition, we do give schools, ideally, we work towards a week in advance so that they have enough time to be able to review and preview those resources to ensure that they're able to create meaningful learning opportunities for their students. So we're cognizant, you know, as an educator, that you, you need time to kind of, you know, look at what's provided to you, go through it, refine and adapt it to the students that are in front of you. So we do strive to give educators at least a week in advance of the particular day or the month in preparation um, for the particular celebration or information or education opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Okay, Trustee Benjamin. Thank you, Trudy Chair. Just an observation that when you go onto the website, on the right side, you get the calendar for the month and every single day, every day, whatever is there. So, you know, I mean, you are, you are, uh, every time you open it, okay, it's there. Some of the two, uh, the, uh, the schools also, they send out the newsletters on which you have the whole heritage month there. And I just want to thank uh, whoever is creating these, uh, the Sikh heritage, 100 years of Sikh heritage. That was a beautiful uh, video. And I often spend time, and I find that much of these videos, uh, which are available there, are really uh, very well put and they are useful. And I have a grandson who is in senior KG who comes home and says, today we learned about this, today we learned about this. And I'm so happy that we have this and he is aware of all these celebrations and important significant days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Benjamin, that's very nice. Um, so all those in receipt uh, for information in this report. Okay, so we have passed. We're now going to go on to 7.4 is a, a trustee a student trustee policy update presented, presented by our governance uh, council. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair, the report before you is the student trustee policy update. As you may recall, at the uh, January 2023 board meeting, the Board of Trustees unanimously passed a motion to update the number of student trustees from two to three to include one self-identifying Indigenous student trustee to be elected by students who voluntarily self-identify as First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. The student trustee policy has been updated to reflect the inclusion of an Indigenous student trustee. Procedures, guidelines, and processes are being developed for the student trustee election to include the Indigenous student trustee. The process will be in place such that an Indigenous student trustee could be elected for the 2024-2025 school year in accordance with the resolution of the board. Have to take any questions. That's wonderful. Um, okay, let's put it on the floor. Uh, I'm gonna have uh, Chair uh, Green put it on the floor and seconded by uh, uh, Trustee Bailey. Uh, any comments or questions? Trustee Davies. Did we ever like get a handle on how many ballots will be cast? How many of our students identify as? And that's a good question on the process. I, you know, I think there's a lot of interest there. Yes, for you. Thank you for the question, and through you, Mr. Chair. That is part of the process, as was alluded to, that we'll be going through um, a part of the self-identifying data that we talked about earlier in the policy will be used to identify Indigenous student trustees or Indigenous students um, so that we can offer the opportunity for them to run as an Indigenous student trustee, and that's how we'll be casting the votes. And I assume those Indigenous students vote for that trustee. That's correct. Good. That's in an operating procedure, not in the policy. Correct. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? Uh, all those in favor? Recommending. Uh, recommending of approval to take it to the board uh, meeting ne next week. All those in favor? Yes. Good. We're on to 7.5. Uh, this is a notice of referral from the March 8th Curriculum Equity and Student Wellbeing Committee. Um, yes, 
the notice here. Okay, sorry. Sorry. So we received a refer to the governor's bring back the report to the committee on the feasibility of adopting the Acton Sustainable School Transportation Charter. Sir? Yes, please. Thank you, and, and through you, Mr. Chair. The delegation process, and we're we're just getting back into delegation processes after supervision, so we're we're having delegations come to committees. And at the last curriculum equity and student well-being committee, there were actually four delegations. Trustees have one of four options at the end of each delegation. The first is to simply receive it. The second is to refer it to staff to report back. The third is to refer it to the director of education for action. And fourth, to refer it to another committee. At the Curriculum uh, Equity Student Wellbeing Committee in March, two of the delegations, there were motions at that committee to refer those delegates to this committee. So these two notice of, of uh, referrals, this item 7.5 and 7.6, are both the notices to this committee that we, as this committee, now have work to do on those referrals. So the referrals are here for your consideration and direction to the staff what to do with those referrals. So the first one, 7.5, is uh, a referral in connection with the active and sustainable school transportation. And the, there was a presentation regarding the active and sustainable school transportation charter. Attached to the notice of referral is the delegation request and a presentation that was made at that committee. So at this point, there's going to be a discussion about the, um, the, the notice of referral on the floor and a discussion if there's any motions coming out of the notice to direct staff about what to do with the charter. I'll be honest, Thank you. This is the first time I've had this in my 20 years, so it's a, it's a little new, so I'm sorry, I'm just trying to catch up to the process. Um, and, and so what I'm going to do, first of all, uh, that we're going to have uh, someone put it on the floor. Trustee McDonald, will you put it on the floor? Try to, uh, seconded by Trustee McDonald. So from what I'm understanding, uh, you're, um, we are open to a conversation around that, and eventually someone can put on the floor a motion of action of some sort, uh, or, or if there's no action. but. I think a delegation at least needs a response as a minimum, to be honest with you. But anyway, uh, that said, I'll open it up and trust you to So just to clar clarify the process, because mm -hmm. in my nine years, I'm going to have this come out of this way too. Because the way I read it, I thought they would to bring back a report to the committee on the feasibility of adopting the act. So do you have to put a motion now again to say that the the staff bring back a report. Also, you have to put a motion here. Okay, just out of curiosity then for the process, why couldn't we do that? Why wasn't that able to um, happen in the curriculum? Yeah, and, and by the way, take that because yeah, I have the same question and, and I think it's a good one. And traditionally, uh, we would have uh, the, the staff provide a response, but now we have the option to send it to the director to get a response, and that would be the traditional way we're used to. Uh, but now we have more options open, and now it's to refer to a committee who maybe that is under their purview of conversation to then maybe look more or then say, no, I want to refer to the director and you can provide the response or staff or, you know, et cetera. So we have all those options now available. Did I summarize that, summarize that correctly? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, you did. And it's because it was referred to a different committee. Had, had the, the motion at the curriculum committee been and staff report back, then staff would have reported back to the curriculum committee. But it was felt at the curriculum committee, um, the, the movers and the seconders felt that it was more appropriate to be at this committee. So then it was referred to this committee, and this committee will consider whether uh, they want to report back from staff that are responsible for this committee. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, that's the mover of the motion of the bring it here. I misunderstood what I was doing. <laughs> because what I wanted to do was get the report at that point. I didn't mean for it to come back here, but sorry, that's my um uh, somehow <laughs> lost in translation. So apologies for that. But if I could put a motion then on the floor to bring back a report to the committee on the feasibility. I guess now it will be governance committee, I guess. So if they could bring it back to the governance committee on the feasibility of adopting the active and sustainable school transportation charter. Okay, and I think we'll just put the word a report from staff, I think, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you have a second? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Trustee Benjamin. Uh, you have five minutes if you want to talk about that or we you know No, I think okay. we had the discussion. Um, does anyone want to have a comment to this? I have a question. Okay, Trustee Bailey. You, Chair. What is the purpose of the active and sustainable school transportation charter? So it's a commitment. It's getting oh, oh, my so it's uh and I'm not sure if you got a chance to read what the charter is, right? So it's, it's a commitment from the board and other parties to work towards um active transportation to school, reducing um vehicular traffic to the school, encouraging walking, biking initiatives. Um, it's and, and you know there are many benefits to that. It's regards to um, first of all the environment, right? Second of all, health and then physical health as well as mental health. Um, and there are many studies that have um, been conducted that shows a direct link to when kids are active, they actually do better in tests. In the test too, um, and and the particular study I'm thinking about actually was in the math, right? And math scores were way up. Um, so it's it's a win-win I think for all to encourage and and even part of the charge we talked about um, uh, communicating and and um, discussions within the community to see like what are the barriers or the obstacles why they won't let the kids walk. Right, getting the pre regional police involved in terms of safe pathways, safe roadways, the cities to make sure the pathways are fixed. Yeah, so a lot of. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McDonald, for answering that. So, uh, do we have any questions before we go to uh, vote on sending this uh, to staff to get a report back? Response? I do have a question. Okay. So, Let's when we get a uh, a report back. So exactly, the report is going to ask you for exactly what? So basically, for example, the financial implication, is it going to be a cost? Like, is it going to be to do what the charter wants? Is it minimal cost? Not really, or is it, you know, a million dollars? Is it something that, you know, feedback from staff? Is they willing to support it? So it's just a matter of looking at, it's similar when um, Catherine Suffolk brought the um, the I can't remember the name, the charter that you adopted. Yeah, so just seeing what's the implication for the board, the risk to the board, things like that. I think that it says oh. there it's a feasibility of adopting the active uh, sustainable school and, and stuff right. charter. So we're going to ask staff to go and look at that and see what are the implications of that. And then we as a committee will look at it and say we like it, maybe we put a policy in place, or we just say accept that, and then it goes to our board meeting, and uh, and then maybe if something happens. But we, again, we can't, not knowing what the report's going to say, but it's look at the feasibility of adopting this charter that was presented in the delegation. Thank you, Chair. I think I'm a little bit uh, confused about this for the simple fact that um, what we're looking at and the reality will be two different things because in, com in getting your children to school is not the board's purview, it's parents and to say how much it will cost for the charter. We can put the charter together, but how will that help parents and how will that support it? So that's why I'm a little bit confused. Yeah. So I think what, what happened and you know, obviously you were there trusting me call the delegation presented that this is the charter. It's, it's really about a philosophy of trying to promote people to, you know, walk, bike, and not use the car. But it's not, uh, you know, uh, it, it may not have any implications to 
costs or not, but that's why normally we get staff to re, you know respond to that and say yes, that's a great uh, idea, um, uh, you know, or or not, and then we as trustees then make a decision on how we want to go forward to that. So basically, we're going to ask the staff to who got the recording, got the delegation to bring their feedback of what this implies. Is it is it outside our peer purview? Is it education? Is it inside our box? Is it financial constraints or not? Is it staffing constraints or not? And with that, then we as trustees, that with that report, make some decisions on that. Does that make it easier? Yes. Good, thank you. Thank and you. Sorry. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Yeah, add to, add to the answer, for example, one of the things that the charter asks us is to locate and design schools to meet demands of future growth that maximizes opportunity for students to walk, cycle, and, pop, and use public transportation. So the staff could respond to that. Is that a feasible thing? Can they do that? Or support the installation of, and all season maintenance of walking and cycling facilities. Can they do that on their school properties? So the staff will bring back that report to, to, to and address, I guess, what the charter is. Ask the question that the board does. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Trustee. Can I just add one more? Yeah, yeah Trustee Benjamin. I agree with what Trustee Bailey said, and there are practical difficulties, so we need to consult with the administrators of the schools because they face a lot of uh, pushback from parents when it comes to having the smooth, uh, you know, operations in the morning and the afternoons, which is very, very challenging. And the second part is the parents. I think we need to educate our parents, so we need to involve, uh, include it somewhere there. How are they going to include the community, encourage them to be part of this charter? That is very, very important. Absolutely, and that's why it's in the charter for them to do this. So the charter is saying part of this, right? So invest resources and meeting culturally, very much manner to support active, um safe and sustainable transportation so that's part of the charter and thank you uh thank you both trusting uh, benjamin and, and mcdonald for the clarifications i know last month i was at a walk to school you know with the city uh you know traffic safety were out there and passing up pencils to get people to walk to school so i that would fall within i assume within that so i'm looking forward to if we have this motion passed to see what the the staff say and then we can then make some directions from that. Anyway, I have uh, our, our governance council. I'll say that too. Conversation. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to clarify that the timing of this will not be to the next meeting because the next meeting is just June 7th. So I just wanted to be clear that yep. the, uh, the expectations this won't be for the next meeting. It will be for a future appropriate meeting. Thank you. I appreciate that timing. Uh, so, all those in favor of uh, referring this to staff uh, for their uh, report? All those in favor? So be it passed. Um, we'll uh, move on to the next notice of motion uh, from the same um, Curriculum Equity Student Wellbeing Committee meeting. Uh, that is, uh, it was uh, recommended the result of the report, uh, re secondary final. Evaluation 2023-24 be received and referred to the Governance and Policy Committee to review. And I see that was uh, put on the floor by uh, Trustee Alves and second by Trustee Clark. So, um, so I'm going to have Trustee uh, Alves to put it on the floor. Uh, do I have a seconder, Trustee uh, uh, Bailey? So. Um, Trustee uh, Alves, do you want to, since this was your referral from the committee, do you uh, do you have an action or a comment that you want to take? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I missed uh, I missed the preamble. Forgive uh, forgive me for that. I was having a bit of technical issues. I'm just going to pull up the agenda quickly and and jump in where we were. Is this the policy? I, I think I might have caught it wrong, but can you refresh me on which? what the um, recommendation was from the last committee meeting so this is uh this is a referral from uh the uh, meeting of march 8th at the uh, curriculum equity student well-being mm -hmm. committee uh that uh that a delegation that i assume was uh, on the secondary final evaluation uh be received and referred to the governance committee policy for review so 
um, similar to the previous item that on 7.5 that we were, were dealing with. Um, this could go, if, since it's your motion, I'm just giving you the opportunity to say, would you like to refer this to staff for a report? Yes. Or, okay. So, sorry, but before we go there. Thank you, and, and through you, Mr. Chair, there was a report as well on that okay. last agenda. There was the secondary final evaluations report for information on the agenda okay. at that time, and it was uh, referred to this committee for review. So it is it is a tad unclear what this committee was meant to do with it. Um, so I'm, I put it to to the committee that uh, you can choose. There already was a report, so. Um, the motion indicated at the time it was referred to this policy for review. The motion or the report rather was included with the agenda with this this package for this meeting. Okay, so, so, so through you, Chair, could we potentially defer this to the June seventh? I think that um, I think we might want to circle back on this. We that could be a motion too to defer this to uh, yep. June seventh. Not I'd like to defer this, uh, put a motion on the floor to defer this to June 7th. Do you have a seconder? Do you have a seconder to defer it to June 7th? Finding out if the, the, the calendar is full already of what's on the agenda for um, June 7th. Thank you for the, the uh, consideration and further question through you, Mr. Chair. We could add this referral to the agenda for June 7th as a, as a deferral from this meeting to the next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, so do I have a uh, Trustee Bailey, do, we, uh, do you have uh, a motion on the floor? You have five minutes, uh, Trustee Lucas, uh, or sorry, Alves, if you want to talk to it or... Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I don't think I need to speak to it. I think we'll, we'll defer it to the next meeting so we can take this back and, and decide, you know, what, what we want to push for it. Um, I think that we just haven't had that time yet. So uh, I'll relinquish the five minutes. Okay, and it's not available. I, I apologize. It, the trustee defer is not available. So, all those in favor of uh, deferring this to uh, June seventh, next meeting, yes. So it's uh, been passed. We're now deferring that. Thing. Thank you. Okay. And let me go back to my super. So I think we have uh, one more item. Oh, it's on the back. Yes. So uh, we're going to move to item eight, uh, which is a memo from. Um, from our uh, policy analyst uh, dated uh, May 8th regarding uh, the Turnitin, Turnitin. Turnitin and software that detects AI generated content. So uh, I assume Trustee Alice, you would like to move this on the floor uh, since it's, yeah, the subject you like. Uh, who wants to second that? Uh, Trustee McDonald, uh, any comments, questions? Just to Tr uh, Trustee Bailey. I read the memo. To clarify, it does use the software as of right now to check, but what is the pre do they only check for um, plagiarism? Thank you. Um, if something seems odd, what is the parameters for checking for plagiarism? How did you know that? Good question. How do you know it's not authentic? Uh, Associate Director Logan. Here. Um, through you, Chair, and in response to your question, uh, Trustee Bailey, um, these tools have a variety of different um, ways in which they work. They're not all the same. And so um, what we tend to do is to develop different approaches to respond to the students, uh, to speak with them about the tools and so forth. And we do have that specific tool that does provide us an opportunity to um, review and check for plagiarism. It's a very uh, useful tool and many of our schools do use it, um, but it's just one out of those tools. But we also have other approaches that support us with that as well. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Trustee Davies. More comments. Um, if anyone has any doubt on how serious this is, um, yesterday, uh, U.S. Congress had a hearing about this and uh, um, 
Richard Lumbell started it with he's, what everyone thought was him speaking when he sat there with his mouth closed. And then, after everyone was convinced that that was how he would open it, because it sounded like him, it was his words, and it was actually done by ChatGPT. And they announced that they said, This was not said by me, none of those are my words. This was at ChatGPT was asked how Richard Lunda would open this hearing. And it not only um, used his voice from different things, but also put words in his mouth, literally. So check that out if you don't think this is serious. Mm -hmm. no, I saw it last night. Yeah, that's being legal today. So, um, so uh, may I ask a question? Uh, I see in the memo uh, that the, uh, the Turnitin uh, software has a feature open for a couple of months and then uh, for AI detection. And then after that, it's offered in the feedback studio, right? The feedback studio. So, uh, so do we have, we have the feedback studio as part of our policy to reuse? Uh, through you, Chair, I don't know all the details around uh, TuneIn. I would, I wish um, Superintendent Hobby was here. He's very intimately involved in whatever he's can. Sorry, he's in. Oh, he's on the line. I don't. Oh, I, I am here. Head. I'm going to turn over to you, <laughs> Superintendent Hobby. I'm glad you're on the line. Jump in. Thank you, <laughs> Superintendent Hobby. Not a problem. Uh, through you, Chair. So. Uh, Turnitin.com, they do have um, this feature that was just mentioned, and it is something that we are exploring because it is additional cost. And so it is something that we are making sure that it is within our means to be able to provide as a support, as we are also engaging in conversation around with the full scope of what it is capable of doing. But it is something that we are very much interested in pursuing and making sure that if it is something that we that is fiscally responsible, that we are going to be able to provide as a tool um, as uh, associate director. Dr. Logan mentioned one um, adding this to the furthering the repertoire of tools that we have available um, for our staff in supporting students. And being the budget chair committee, uh, or committee chair, whatever, um, maybe that's a business case mm -hmm. to be put on there for um, to be considered uh, for the budget. Then, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Trustee Alice, that Oh, Trustee uh, Alice. Yes. Um, so I. I Realize we're using Turnitin. Um, just a question: um, Has the PDSB just considered using ChatGPT? Uh, ChatGPT offers a, a free service that it will will preemptively tell you if it's written anything itself. Um, and then there's a paid feature. Have we explored that avenue? Through you, Chair. Um, that is something that we have not officially explored as of yet. We are aware of a variety of other software companies who are trying to capitalize on the power and the opportunity that ChatGPT provides. Um, however, um, as far as um, that particular feature that you just referenced, no, that is not something that we have pursued at this time. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, I, I uh, appreciate the memo. I, I don't have any specific questions relating to this memo, Chair. Um, not sure if it would be appropriate, so I'll ask uh, you, Chair, but I have a question for a follow-up from a meeting past regarding AI policy. Would would it be all right if I asked that follow-up? Yeah, I, let's ask the question and see where it goes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, so through you, I, I, I believe at Governance Pass we had talked about a uh, staff AI policy. Um, I was just wondering if we could find out wh where where we are on that. I know that uh, that this is the committee where I had originally brought it up. I'm just wondering what the status is. Thank you. Can someone uh, feel that? Uh, Governance uh, Council. Thank you. And through you, I believe that the questions that were asked at the at the meeting are answered in this in this memo. And I think that the the and I don't have it in front of me, so I apologize, but I think that the um, um, possibility was to bring back a policy on plagiarism in the in the future. We are not there at this point. We did not did not have the opportunity to get that done, of course, for this meeting, but that that I understand is the next steps. That policy yeah. on plagiarism 
would would include plagiarism on PDSB would be um, for students and for staff. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I, the, I think I had asked for staff to bring a report on the staff policy regarding uh, the use of AI from within the PDSB uh, to draft things, you know, whatever they may be through the use of chatbots. And then the staff, the student policy is different. I, I remember I had specified that the student policy would be discussed in curriculum, but the staff policy would be discussed in governance. Um, so the request was to to bring that staff bring a report regarding that policy and and if it exists. I remember at the time we asked staff were unsure of it. Um, so hoping we can we can get that back uh, up and running. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, Sean, our policy analyst, to uh, respond. Yeah, uh, through you, Chair. Um, it is my understanding that in the interim time between the governance and policy committees, we'd be working um, with Trustee Alice to develop a motion. Um, that would allow us to bring back a report or policy um, on staff use of AI. And so I believe it was for us to sort of take it back and to formulate a formal motion based on my understanding um, around staff use of AI. Is that okay, Trustee Hans? Uh, thank you, yeah, through you, Chair. Uh, would it be appropriate at this time to ask for that motion on the floor for staff to bring, uh, to direct staff to bring a report on the status of uh, that policy? I guess it would be in, in correct form, yes. So uh, you have a seconder for that, Trustee Bailey. Um, since it's a direct to staff, we can open it up for five minutes debate if you wish. You have any opening com comments? No, uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, I, I don't have any opening comments. Uh, my only note is that I think it's, you know, given the vulnerabilities that come with uh, access to these chatbot services, I think it's important that uh, we look to protect the institution. I know that uh, I'm going to misquote here, but uh, I, one of our government agencies, a regulatory body, I, be, I don't, it wasn't our GC, but um, give me one sec. I'm going to just, I'm just pulling up a quote quickly. Um, sorry. The, I've got it here, sorry, I'm just loading. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada issued concerns over ChatGPT specifically um, regarding things like access to data through its uh, developers, OpenAI, which is the operator of ChatGPT. So the purpose of this motion is to ask staff to deliver a policy to the Board of Trustees on the status of, of the plagiarism policy for staff. And then uh, the intention is that down the line, if one does not exist, that we develop one that would uh, regulate the use of these types of softwares for staff to protect things like our data and access to our servers. Thank you. So we have a, 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 a seconder and it's on the floor. Uh, those, uh, unless I have any comments, we'll go to vote. All those in favor of, of that, uh, so we have passed. So we have that motion passed. Um, any other comments on our on this memo before we move on? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on uh, to item uh, nine, which we do not have any motions for consideration. Item ten, uh, no notices of motion. So I'm going to go to adjournment. So who would like to put that on floor? Trustee McDonald, seconded by Trustee Bailey. I'm oh, okay. oh, sorry. Okay, uh, Trustee Benjamin put this uh, seconded. All those in favor of adjournment? So we adjourn. Thank you, everyone.